My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC ECHO. Welcome to this week's session, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. Thank you, Brian. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD, is, is what we'll talk about this morning and its relationship to HIV infection. So I've organized the talk this way, something on definitions and epidemiology, a few slides on pathogenesis, natural history, diagnosing, and staging and NAFLD, and then treatment, and I'll try to summarize things in the last slide or two. So first, definitions and epidemiology. NAFLD really encompasses uh, two major pathologically defined disorders. Uh, the first is simple hepatic steatosis, or uh, the accumulation of fat that can be in these uh, macro vesicles, which are appreciated here, these big globules of fat, and they can also be microvesicles, which you can see here in some of these hepatocytes. But it's just fat that accumulates in the liver. And uh, differentiating that, you might also call that NAFL from a non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, uh, which implies that there's fat and then some hepatocellular injury. So in these uh, photomicrographs here, you see fat here and then macroglobular and microvesicular fat here. And then NASH is really the development of these uh, inflammatory exudates that happen in and around that fatty liver. And NASH, the problem with NASH is that it can pro progress to fibrosis and cirrhosis. So 2 to 3% of people with NAFL, so just fat, will progress to cirrhosis over 20, 10 to 20 years. But 15 to 20% of people with NASH will progress to cirrhosis or tw uh, over uh, 10 to 20 years. So here is, again, a picture of somebody with NASH. This is a picture of somebody who has NASH and is starting to fibrose. Those are the reticular blue fibers throughout the liver. And then this is a core biopsy of somebody that has a cirrhosis. So this is incredibly common. That's one thing I learned when uh, looking this up. 25% of the world's population has a fatty liver disease. And it is higher in Hispanic and European populations than in African populations. Risk factors, I think many of us know already, and include obesity, type 2 diabetes, and insulin resistance is thought to be key in the uh, pathogenesis of uh, NAFLD, increased waist circumference, hyperglyceridemia, and some uh, genetic predispositions, some uh, variations in the genes that code for these adipocyte cytokines. Adiponeutrin is one, and then HCV and HIV itself are, are also risk factors for NAFLD. 3% of this world's population has NASH, and then it is overrepresented among diabetics, where up to 20% of diabetics can have it, those with morbid obesity, and 10% of hep C infected people have NASH by biopsy. So what about persons who are HIV infected? Well, NAFL, uh, this is based on imaging studies, so just fatty liver, not NASH, but NAFL is present in 35% of HIV infected patients who have submitted to some form of imaging to look for that. Among those people with NAFL, and it wasn't clear from the, the papers that I referenced down at the bottom, I think they must be referring to people that have a diagnosis of NAFL. 42% of those in biopsy studies are shown to have NASH. And then of those people that have NASH, 22% of them will have evidence for fibrosis in biopsy studies. So risk factors for having fatty liver disease with HIV are overlapping with those in the general population. So a high BMI an enlarged weight, uh, waist circumference, diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes again. Hypertension sorts out in some studies, which is not in the general population. Elevated triglycerides, a high CD4 count, a little surprising. Hep C infection, especially genotype 3. And then, and I'll talk about this in a second, exposure to certain nucleoside agents, especially the old thymidine analogs, AZT, D4, T, and DDI, are associated with, with uh, fatty liver disease. Surprisingly, not associated with it is a high viral load and the duration that you've been HIV infected and the duration of time that you've been on heart and your CD4 nadir are not factors that sort out as associated with liver, uh, fatty liver disease. Risks for fibrosis are, are listed there. So how does this all happen? Well, it's complicated and it's not very clear. There, for the longest time, there's been this two-hit hypothesis that you start with insulin resistance and insulin resistance leads to the accumulation of fat in the liver. So that's one hit. And then the cellular fat leads to cell dysfunction that's mediated by these pro-inflammatory cytokines and adipokines, and those lead to hepatic injury, 
and inflammation. So lots of hand waving there. An alternative theory is that adipose tissue, not adipose tissue in the liver, but adipose tissue everywhere, is a source of these adipocytokines that include TNF, leptin, adiponectin, and that these cytokines mediate a mitochondrial oxidative stress and cytokine-induced liver injury, and that the accumulation of fat in the liver is an epiphenomenon from this liver injury. So whether the fat comes first and that that leads to liver damage, or whether just fat elsewhere in your body secretes these adipokines and that these lead to a mitochondrial stress and liver damage and the fat accumulates as a secondary phenomenon is not very clear. So in HIV, it gets even uh, more complicated. So, and uh, you might divide it into uh, different eras in, in HIV, although I think there's great overlap here, but just for simplicity and if you're a splitter instead of a lumper, you might appreciate this. So maybe early on in the HIV epidemic, I think we all recognize that HIV-infected patients who were not on therapy had hypertriglyceridemia. It was just a very common feature of their lipid profile. And there are data that patients who have uh, severe malnutrition and hypertriglyceridemia will start to accumulate fat in their liver. So maybe that was a prominent uh, pathogenic mechanism early on. Later, when we were all using drugs that we liked at the time but have come to hate, AZT, D4T, and DDI, we recognize that these drugs are especially toxic to mitochondria, and so mitochondrial toxicity is associated with uh, fatty liver disease. And it may be, in these cases, you'd call that secondary NAFLD instead of primary NAFLD, and that actually carries a worse uh, prognosis. It's more often microvesicular than macrovesicular, and it has a higher uh, progression rate to uh, liver fibrosis. And then more recently, now that we're not using these mitochondrial toxic agents any longer, maybe the risk factors in the pathogenesis is like that in the general population. It's more associated with insulin resistance, which might be associated with protease inhibitors, lipodystrophy, and one difference, it's not really associated with obesity in HIV-infected patients like it is in the general population. So you could organize this in a temporal sequence, but I think that all of these things might exist in some overlapping way at any one time. And then there's been another paradigm that's been put forth, and that is a virus-associated fatty liver disease. This was uh, put forth by Guraldi in a couple of papers that I summarized here. And he would classify people that have just a, a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, that that's really driven by a lot of the factors that drive the development of a metabolic syndrome. So being overweight, high cholesterol, that is non-HIV infected NAFLD. HIV infection of viral associated liver disease might be driven primarily by drug toxicities, and that is associated with waist circumference that's high. And then HCV, another virus-associated fatty liver disease, is driven primarily by insulin resistance, shown here, elevated ALTs, and insulin resistance is key in the development of that. So this is just another way of thinking about the pathogenesis, and then that there may be this, this concept of virally associated fatty liver disease that's a little different than people without viral infections, HIV and hep C. Putting that all together, it is quite complicated. It can start here with the environment that of people who eat a lot of us uh, saturated fats and fructose and carbohydrates and have a sedentary lifestyle. That feeds into getting obese, which leads to fatty liver. Hepatitis C, especially genotype 3, is a host factor. And then HIV infection working through antiretroviral therapy, lipodystrophy, and the development of a metabolic syndrome would also be a host factor that would lead to fatty liver disease. The genetic predispositions are listed here. And then mitochondrial dysfunction, maybe through HIV-related medications in particular, is another factor that can lead from a normal liver, again, going through steatosis, which is simple and non-inflammatory, and then inflammatory steatosis, which is NASH, and then that leads to cirrhosis. Just a few points on natural history. Among HIV-infected patients who have NASH, 30% will have fibrosis at the time of diagnosis, so at the time of biopsy, and 10% will progress to cirrhosis in this uh, wide span of 3 to 14 years. HIV-infected people who have fatty liver disease, up to 10 to 15% will progress to NASH, and then 15 to 20% of those with NASH will, present to cirro will progress to cirrhosis. 
Those who have NAFL with elevated LFTs at the time of biopsy, 30 to 65 percent of those people will have NASH on liver biopsy. How do you make the diagnosis of, of fatty liver and NASH? Uh, and, and why do you want to do that? You want to do that because for people that have NASH, they have a significant risk for developing fibrosis and cirrhosis, and if you can intervene and prevent that, then you obviously want to do it. Unfortunately, the, the only way to definitely diagnose somebody with NASH is liver biopsy. That is the gold standard for distinguishing fatty liver, simple fatty liver, from an inflamed liver or, or NASH. But even that, liver biopsy is not, is not perfect. Um, you're only sampling, you know, one fifty thousandth of your liver with a biopsy, so you could miss somebody just due to sampling error. There has been, there is a, a score, an assessment score, a NASH assessment score that is based on the degree of steatosis, lobular inflammation, and necrosis. I've seen the score range between one and over four, uh, but that's just what pathologists use to uh, assign the degree of NASH. Unfortunately, non-invasive testing cannot really measure necroinflammation, and you can have that with normal LFTs. So all the, all the imaging that we use can't make the diagnosis of NASH with certainty. We can use them to measure fat, fat content, and we can use ultrasound with uh, controlled attenuated parameters, or CAP, and we can use MR to also measure the fat content. And we have measures of fibrosis, fibro scans using transient elast elastography and uh, various scoring systems that can tell you how stiff the liver is. But none of these tell you with, def with, with any certainty that you have NASH instead of just fatty liver. There are some risk factors for having NASH, and those include diabetes and elevated AST or ALT, being older, and increased BMI, and this just pops up in all the papers I reviewed. Panhypopituitarism is associated with NASH for some reason, but there's not a good a commercially available blood test to tell you whether or not you have necroinflammation with fat. People are looking at this uh, marker called cytokeratin 18, which is a breakdown product from apoptotic patocytes, but it's not co commercially available. So most of the papers suggest that we risk stratify people. So if you have someone who you think has hepatic steatosis on imaging, then make sure they're not drinking and make sure they don't have another reason to have a fatty liver like hemochromatosis or something else. If you confirm that it's NAFLD, then risk stratify them. So if they have either intermediate or high risk profile with BMIs that are listed here, AST or ALTs that are listed here, multiple features of the metabolic syndrome or fibrosis scores that are listed here, under those two circumstances, intermediate risk or high risk profile, then consider doing a liver biopsy to document whether or not they have NASH. And the reason for doing that is that if they have NASH, they're at much higher risk for developing fibrosis and cirrhosis, and you'd want to intervene and do something. So then finally, if you've made the diagnosis of NASH, then how do you treat it? The cornerstone for treatment is really dietary modification and exercise. This one study that was published about uh, several years ago, looked at almost 300 patients who had biopsy-proven NASH, and they were treated with dietary restriction to 750 kcals below their basal energy requirements and had paired liver biopsies done before and after the intervention. Those who had uh, greater than a 10% body, wa uh, body weight loss, 90% of those individuals had complete resolution of NASH. And you can see that if they, had, if they had lesser amounts of weight reduction, then it had a less effect on the NASH resolution. And the only patients that had any improvements in their, in their fibrosis scores were those that had the most weight loss, so greater than 10%. There are some pharmacologic therapies. Vitamin E and pioglitazone was looked at in uh, one study called the PIVIN study, which was a, a prospective randomized placebo-controlled study of around 250 patients who all had NASH with uh, NAS scores greater than or equal to four. None of these people had diabetes or cirrhosis, and they were randomized to receive vitamin E or pioglitazone or both. The patients who got vitamin E did have a reduced NAS or NA score, but no improvements in fibrosis. The PIO group had improvements in NASH, but it was not significantly uh, better than the placebo group and it was much less than the vitamin E treated group. The problem with these therapies is that they're not necessarily benign. Vitamin E has been associated with an increase in all-cause all all mortality in other studies through cardiovascular events and might be linked to enhanced uh, rates of prostate cancer. So you'd think of it as a 
simple, easy therapy, but, but it may have these other risks. And then pioglitazone is associated with weight gain, osteopenia, congestive heart failure, and bladder cancer. So it's not a freebie either. This agent, uh, betacolic acid, is a bile acid and agonist of the farsenoid X receptor. Don't ask me any questions about that. When you uh, bind that receptor, it will decrease hepatic lipo and gluconeogenesis and increases insulin sensitivity. So that's the reason these agents were chosen. In the Flint study, people who got obeticolic acid noticed improvements in their NA scores by two points. In fact, they improved so well that the DSMMB stopped the study and improvements in fibrosis were also noted. A problem with this is that pruritus was uh, present in 25% of patients and a few of them had to stop because of that. Pentoxyphylene has been looked at in a couple of randomized prospective studies. Uh, the data are less convincing in, the, in the, this one study. Uh, at one year into treatment, steatosis and ballooning were improved, but not significantly compro- improved compared to placebo. And then in this second study, there was an improvement again in the NASH scores in 39% versus 14% in the placebo group, and they had improvements in inflammation and fibrosis as well. But it hasn't been picked up, I think, because there are these differences between the studies as a prominent treatment at this point. And then other remedies. If you have a patient who is on some of the old mitochondrially uh, toxic medications, AZT, D4T, and DDI, losing those is a good idea. If you have someone who is struggling with uh, insulin uh, resistance and they're on a protease inhibitor, then uh, switching them to a non-PI regimen would be reasonable. Bariatric surgery for people who are morbidly obese can reverse fatty liver, NASH, and fibrosis. And hep C in this association with NAFL, especially genotype 3, I'm not sure why, but treating hep C can also reverse some of those fatty changes. And then I just listed some other medications that are under study, but really haven't met uh, criteria yet to be used uh, clinically. That's it. In summary, NAFLD is really two entities, a fat, simple fatty liver, or NAFL, and an inflammatory fatty liver, or NASH. It's extremely common in HIV patients. Maybe a third of our patients have it if we bother to image them and look. It's associated with the older DNRTIs, AZT, D4T, and DDI, higher weights, uh, higher BMI, hypertriglyceridemia, diabetes, elevated CD4 counts, surprisingly, and hepatitis uh, C genotype 3. The diagnosis really requires liver biopsy, and it's helpful to risk stratify your patients who have a simple fatty liver into those at intermediate and high risk, and if they fit into those categories, then biopsy them to see if they have NASH. You want to do that because then you're going to intervene, and the intervene which, in, intervention should be weight loss and exercise to lose as much as you can, but 10% of your body weight really leads to significant improvements. If they have hep C, treat it. And if they're on AZT, D4T, IDDI, or possibly PIs, look for alternatives for ART. And the drugs that I think are, that are most commonly used are probably vitamin E by most hepatologists at 800 milligrams a day, more so than pioglitazone, obeticolic acid, or pentoxyphylline.